Why are you doing this to me? Okay, Why? it's going. Hey, Slacker, it's going now. It's going now? It's going now. I'm going to kill. I'm going to fight you, Justin. I swear to God. I'm keeping this in. Oh, good. All right. You should. Cold open that shit. All right. Live people ignore the strange and unusual. I, myself, am strange and unusual. Um, that sounds familiar. Hmm. Oh, yeah. It's a pretty big movie. Pretty big movie from our time period. Our time period. That's a, that's, that's that's quite a long time, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, this is uh, this is this is something you I know you have seen, and probably like every every person around our age. Uh huh. Any uh, hint of Roonies? Strange and um, unusual. I mean, Beetlejuice <clears throat> comes to mind, but it sounds a little bit more. That's yeah. That's it. Yeah, you got it, fam. <laughs> Season like, four of the Average Joe's Movie Clubcast. It's Justin. And I'm Joey, and we're obviously starting out with a bang here. <laughs> Man, it's showtime. Well, I guess Joey wanted an epic start to this season as we check out one of the most acclaimed and also ridiculed movies of all time. As we get our good old Southern Gent charm on to talk about Gone with the Wind. Plus, Jet Li takes on a journey filled with ups and downs of kung fu living in Fearless from 2006. As always, we do discuss our full thoughts on these films, so if you've not seen them, please skip avo- ahead to avoid any spoilers. If One of these want. movies is like 80 years old, so you know I apologize if we spoil it for you. <laughs> And if you want to follow us, uh, make sure to hit that subscribe button, leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Suggest a movie. Doing things a little different here in season four, aren't we? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Just uh, picking whatever we want. So I've already yeah. kind of got a strategy for how I'm going to go about it. So it's going to be it's going to be interesting. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah that'll give us a lot more freedom and not have to wait with bated breath as um, we pick random movies based on uh, different categories and so forth but um yeah taking away the categories just going to do straight up movies um that we want to watch both of us and oh yeah not numbering the episodes this is just season four until i don't know whenever jo- jo- joey says we need to stop season four. Oh well it's me kind of hard if we're not counting the episodes but it's fine it's fine because we're not going to number them, but I'm still going to have to number them to put them on, like, Spotify. So, yeah. <clears throat> maybe um, August. Maybe maybe when I turn another year older, we'll say, hey, it's season five. Oh. Yeah, yeah, but sorry. where did that summer go? How's your summer been? Oh, my summer has been interesting. Um... You know, mostly just working at the bank. Um, I did actually just get back from going to see uh, my kiddo for um, for their birthday. Uh, she turned 14. Wow. So her and her friends did like an escape room. And, um, you know, then they ate a bunch of pizza and cake and, you know, 
hung out and made noise until like three or four o'clock in the morning. Um, cause I actually just went and stayed with her, um, at her house. So, you know, her mom, um, you know, obviously my ex and, uh, her stepdad and I stayed in their guest room. And while they were doing stuff, we just acted like old adults and hung out and talked and blah, blah, blah. So that was fun. Um, so does she have any favorite movies? Um, actually we did discuss some movies and it was kind of surprising because uh, she was talking to me about like stuff that would be on Schlock Talk. Like she asked me if I had seen Lamageddon. Um. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, she is a fan. Apple doesn't of, fall, fall far from the tree. Um. I mean, for me, that's a newer thing. I mean, honestly, but let me see if I can find. Because she she told me about two. I don't think I added them to my I might have added them to my watch list, but I know that I sent them in a chat. But we were talking about Lamageddon and then like Zombievers and um Oh my god, you know, it's just easier this way. I don't know. I'm trying to make my life more difficult than it needs to be. Internet don't one is called Attack of the Killer Donuts. And the other one is called 2025. Um, and that has one of the <laughs> lowest ratings I have ever seen on a on Letterbox. It's uh, rating is 0.7 stars. Nice. And that's 2025? Yes. The Attack of the Killer Donuts uh, has a 1.9. So it's, um, it's probably just about as bad as a movie I'm going to talk about here in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly coming up. So, um... <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Joey's quest to watch the shittiest of the shit. Okay, there was a story with that one, and we'll get into that. But um, sometimes those movies you find a diamond in the rough, like Llama Geddon, when there's an emotional support llama, and you know it was made on like three thousand dollars, <laughs> or you know you find like Don't Fuck in the Woods, and it's a very cheap made slasher movie, but very well made for its budget. But then you, for every, you know, a couple of those, you end up with the drizzling shits. So it is a, it is a give and take. So, um, oh, I also had a fucking ginormous ass burger from this place called Oshi in Virginia Beach. It was a hamburger patty that was uh, covered in panko and then deep fried a piece of chicken covered in panko and deep fried and then a piece of like like a pork chop covered mm. in panko and deep fried and then covered with pork belly or topped with pork belly mm. lettuce tomato onions and pickles and uh, i put some kaizu sauce on it and that shit was slamming and uh yeah i ate it with my hands not a fork and a knife because mm. my mama didn't raise no bitch um <laughs> so yeah no that was uh that was my weekend, a weird trip back home because the GPS rerouted me through the fucking country, countryside of Virginia and North Carolina instead of down of uh, like 64 or whatever to 95. It took me forever to get on 95, so that was uh, an experience. Um, so. All right, yep. Only two weeks left to summer. Gosh, I can't believe, like, between all the baseball and we've been doing a lot of trips this summer, it's just like gone by so fast and only two eight more weeks of getting to sleep in and then we're back to getting back up to drop the kiddos off at school all thankfully of all of them will be uh at the same school this year so uh well that's good school started back in florence today so really oh two more weeks here in charleston yeah i mean but let's be real in south carolina summer doesn't end until like december so mm -hmm. oh. yeah at least yeah late november december is when it <laughs> Might start feeling like kind of fall. <clears throat> but I had this, this pretty interesting epiphany. So my kids wanted to see Super Pets this weekend. I didn't really want to see it, but I saw some nice buzz about it. So I was like, all right, we'll go see Super Pets. They, I normally go to the Regal, and I, I've always complained that I pay out the ass to go see movies at Regal. Sometimes the cheapest I pay, I saw Thor for like 30 bucks just because we had like a bunch of Regal points and a bunch of free tickets. So that was pretty sweet. But um, yeah, so we went to an older theater. It didn't have like the stadium seating, just kind of like the slant. But then it dawns on me and like, 
Well, we sit in the front row anyways, so what does it matter what the rest of the theater looks like? Anywho, so we went to see Super Pets, uh, $5 a pop um, for tickets uh, for matinee price. And yeah, so saw Super Pets for like $25 plus uh, got the tickets and a water. So uh, yeah, I'm going to have to be going to some cheaper theaters. I think I think I've been paying the, the big big movie companies too much money. I mean, yeah, going for cheap sounds good. I actually was contemplating picking up the Regal Pass. Oh, yeah. It's $20 uh, for unlimited for the month. That, that that could work. Yeah, I mean, you go to two movies and it pays for itself. I mean, like I just bought tickets to Thor when we when I went and saw that, and I just picked up tickets to Clerks 3 because I'm only there's only literally two showings on a Tuesday and a Thursday when that movie comes out. So I went ahead and bought those. Um, but that reminds me. When does that come out? In September. September 13th oh. and September 15th is when it's showing here in town in Florence. Um, but it does remind me. So one of my buddies, um, I'll go ahead and shout him out again. My buddy Ryan, who I went to high school with. Um, mm-hmm. And we've, uh, you know, we haven't been the closest, but we've stayed in touch. You know, friends on Facebook. I, um, you know, I know his girlfriend. I knew both of them separately and all of that. He went to New Jersey and he went to Jay and Silent Bob's Secret Stash. Okay. And, you know, he knew I was a big Kevin Smith fan. He knew I was big into movies. And he was like, hey, man, you want me to bring you something back? And I was like, sure. And so, you know, I was thinking it was going to be like some little knickknack, you know, maybe maybe a pop or, you know, just like a comic book or, you know, something, you know, something low key. He actually brought me back a screenplay for Clerks 2 signed by Kevin Smith and Jason Muse. Yeah. So I when when we met thursday of last week and he gave me i kind of just sat there and like shock for like like i don't know what felt like forever um just like holy shit like this is way above and beyond so um nice. anybody if ryan if you're listening to this or christine and i already told you guys thank you but again thank you guys because that was awesome very cool and uh yeah i've been uh, definitely hitting up the roller coasters this summer we went to uh, carowinds earlier in the year and dollywood and the Smokies, that was a nice trip. And now I'm going to Bush Gardens this weekend for uh, my 13th wedding anniversary slash my wife's birthday. So, um, yeah. Seal summer off with uh, some more fun, hopefully. Um, this We'll be staying at the same hotel that has an arcade. And uh, you can go and get a whole roll of quarters to play some Simpsons Arcade. That was some fun with the boys last time. and So I look forward to doing that again. Nice. I mean, I miss uh, Carowinds being owned by Paramount. Oh, for the more, more the movie theme. Yeah, yeah, you know, because the, the it was the roller coasters. Even though I don't like the roller coasters, but you know, Days of Thunder and Top Gun and just had that whole thing going on with it. So, and mm-hmm. I didn't even realize it until I, mean, I don't know a few years ago that they weren't owned by Paramount Paramount anymore. So. Yeah, Cedar Fair, way better. Sweet rides. There's the same rides with different names, right? Like, no, it, uh, Cedar Fair built uh, the Intimidator for them, and uh, the Fury, and then Copperhead, and of course they built the Intimidator. Of course they did. Well, there's actually another version of Intimidator at the uh, Kings oh. Island Park. Praise hail, Richmond. praise Dale. <laughs> All right, you want to talk some movies? How yeah, about some good, the bad, and the ugly? All right, here uh, for good. Um, yeah, I'm doing good, bad, and ugly. Classic style. Looks like uh, you are too. Same. Yeah, same. All right, you want to go first? You want to you want to make me pick first, or you want to pick first? Make me talk first. All right, give me the good. The good. Um, so I recently did another episode. I've always wanted to watch that with a really cool dude. And named Sean, and we talked about one of the um, Coen Brothers' lesser-rated movies, *The Hudsucker Proxy*. It's kind of a um, workplace satire, kind of on the lines of like I don't know, *The Apartment*, maybe uh, *Prince and the Popper kind of thing, where 
this kind of average Joe who doesn't think he can get it where anywhere in the world instantly becomes top of a company out of um, this kind of wheeling and dealing with the stocks. Um, great quirky uh, Cohen's comedy, dark comedy there. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of good stuff in that one. The Hoodsucker Proxy took me by surprise. Definitely not a kids movie, but it is um, only a PG. Uh, movie for the Coens, which is unusual. Um, one to check out for sure. I recommend it. I don't compute the words that just came out of your mouth, but okay. I'll keep that in mind. I actually uh, meant to check that out while I was driving and I forgot. So that's my, my bad. Um, you were you meant to check out what? Your your podcast while I was driving for oh okay like five hours on the Friday and like six hours yesterday. Okay, okay. But I forgot. That's my so bad. What, it's, no, it's okay. What's, what's your good? My good is the unbearable weight of massive talent. Oh, nice. I still need to see it. Oh, all right. So this is going to sound fucking absurd if you don't know what it is, but it is Nicolas Cage playing Nicolas Cage, who ends up being a spy for the CIA and I know that that sounds over the top and it is it's over the top in like all the right ways him and Pedro Pascal fucking do it up right I recommend that you all just go and watch this because it is just fucking fantastic and that's what I have to say okay okay all right I'm just gonna go down the line you made the bad okay so for the bad, I went with The Big Green. Um, I'd never seen this movie before. This is the little kid uh, soccer movie, kind of in the spirit of Sandlot, in the spirit of Little Giants. It's basically like, hey, they wrenched and repeated one more of these uh, sports movies. Um, it does play up its soccer elements pretty well. There's the whole, like, it's not just a bunch of, like, whenever it gets into the soccer action, it doesn't, it's not just like montage stuff. It actually does follow the action of the game pretty well. Um, it's just one of these quirky little uh, kid sports movies, but it just feels so borrowed from like the earlier ones. So, I mean, you like you watch and you're like, oh yeah, that's the guy who said you're killing me, Smalls, and now he's a goalie and he has a lot more to do and it's not quite as interesting. But um, I mean, cute little sports movie for kids, but it's definitely if you've seen a few of them, yeah, uh, you didn't miss anything with this one. So I think I saw that if it's what I recall. When I was a kid, like well before I saw the Sandlot and stuff, so I mean I had seen like oh. it, like because you know I remember seeing the two ba the two big baseball movies for kids, um, so does that Rookie of the Year and uh, Angels in the Outfield, and then mm -hmm. not the sand not the Sandlot until like last year or the year before, and mm -hmm. then I had seen Little Giants and then I saw this, so I remember thinking it was okay. I don't remember thinking it was like the greatest thing ever, but like you know I would have I didn't know that it was the kid from. The Sandlot, or you know, anything like that. So, um, it's funny that like the main, uh, the lead actor, stay played by uh, I guess Steve Gutenberg is his name. Um, the only reason he's like in it, he, they call him Deputy Dog, and he's basically has the hots for their uh, their British uh, coach slash teacher. So that that's amusing. Um, yeah, they have basically no soccer experience whatsoever when they step out on the field versus like the top team in the league and they look pretty ri ridiculous as they get slaughtered and then there's not a whole lot of buildup between that and them actually being a decent soccer team of course um actually the movie t has a few uh touches on political issues like immigration and like foreign like isolationism in the u.s so um some interesting political topics to mention there in terms of um in connection with soccer but pretty light it's you know it's still just a kids movie and um yeah a familiar one at that so you're bad my bad my bad oh yeah you're not gonna probably be a fan of this it comes from a very acclaimed director one mr paul thomas anderson and that mm. is licorice pizza so i'm gonna preface this they could literally have changed one detail about this movie. One detail. And this movie goes from being at the bottom of my list for the year to near the top of the list. Why the fuck is the boy 15? 
you you've seen this right justin Mm -hmm. yeah why is that boy 15 why is he not 19 if he is fucking 18 19 years old this whole movie changes and it's not fucking gross and where it's good but the fact that that girl is like 25 and that kid is 15 the movie is fucking weird and i'm not about it and that's yeah that's Everything else, all the shenanigans they get into in the 70s and all of that, all he has to be is 18. And fucking, it's the same. Same thing. Also, the kid was kind of a prick, but neither here nor there. Okay. Um, I knew, I remember there being some interesting chemistry stuff involved with uh, his mindset as being a younger guy compared to her being uh, older. I don't remember her being that much older. I thought like, oh, no. it was more like a teenager and she's like 19 or something but no no she was 25 they explicitly said she was 25 no okay yeah um i mean i generally don't key in too much about stuff like that in movies if like the chemistry's there um sorry that was a hang up for you <clears throat> yeah no it was just it was not it was not cool but anyway let's move on what's your the ugly my ugly. Um, I finally saw Idiocracy. It's a pretty funny movie, but it has really, really bad futuristic special effects. Maybe to a comedic fault. Um, yeah, this is a very cynical movie about basically... Um, have you ever seen Idiocracy? I don't think that I have. I've, I've, I've heard of it, but I couldn't tell you... This is the, from the same guy who made Beavis and Butthead in Office Space. Um, so my this, judge... Star, yes, stars. Um, it's not. It, is it Ben Wilson? Owen Wilson's brother? Or, um, is, it, is it? Is it Ben Wilson? Ben Wilson. Is it Ben Wilson. I don't think that's right. It's Owen Wilson and Luke Wilson. Luke Wilson. Okay. And he's in the army, and he gets sent in the future as some part of like freezing process, but. That uh, project goes out of business and he ends up way in the future where basically not so smart people have overrun the world. The Jerry Springer types over the intelligent people that aren't, you know, rapidly spurting out kids. Um, So it's pretty ridiculous on that level. There's a few things they touch here and there with like advertising and just culture in general. Uh, It's been a little while, so some of the funny parts have faded from mine. But um. At least, like, unlike uh, my one complaint about Office Space is that it kind of peters off toward the end where it, it does kind of main, maintain throughout um, momentum through idiocracy. Um, but ugly with the special effects, but quite funny with the satire of society going to pot. You're ugly? Mm, boy, so this was one of the lowest rated movies on IMDb history this movie was so lowly rated on letterbox it actually had over a star rating and carl felt that he he doesn't rate movies and he rated this movie so we could try to get it beneath one star on letterbox (laughs) that is jurassic shark so initially we weren't going to watch jurassic shark no um I had a I had a lady friend coming over who also is a fan of bad movies, and so this is the first time we were hanging out like at my house, and we were gonna watch a movie. Um, not that it was gonna be a lot better, but um, it was called Sharkula, and that was almost at like four point five stars on IMDb versus like one point seven for Jurassic Shark. So you know a lot better, but Sharkula cost five dollars. Jurassic Shark was free, on Tubi. And we, it was like 75 minutes and we were begging for the commercial breaks. Like, I believe one of the lines uttered at the end of the movie by Carl was that that there was better CGI when there weren't computers. Um, so the premise is that the fucking Megalodon shark was, these people were drilling for oil in a lake. They found a crater that had an iceberg in it. They drained the iceberg so they could keep drilling, which released the Megalodon. And at the beginning of the movie, they tell you that a megalodon is like 50 feet long. They also tell you that it lived anywhere from 28 to 1.5 million years ago. Not 
so so anywhere from the 80s this movie was made in like 2012 so anywhere from like 1984 to 1. 1.5 million years ago megalodons lived and then someone else said it was there was it was 200 million years old and then someone said it was like 100 million years old so they never had the time right the cgi sucked but the shark is in a fucking freshwater lake and it's supposed to be like 50 feet long and it looked like a fucking baby white shark um the dialogue was terrible the characters were terrible every everything was terrible and it was like tv 14 so there weren't any like boobies or anything to like save you to break it up it was um it was fucking the worst it is my worst movie for the year currently um and i don't see it being beaten um and it's also my lowest rated movie for the year on average if you have um patron patron stats so um yeah no that is i don't don't go watch it don't just don't just please don't we watched it so we don't have to yeah that was some hot ass trash that i watched and you you i'm begging you don't like i've watched some hot ass trash that was pretty good you know llamageddon zombievers and shit that is that is not one of them just just keep on trucking they made a fucking sequel keep on trucking all right let's get into some of these feature movies of this episode so we're gonna start off with joey's pick gum with the wind is from 1939 american epic historical romance film adapted from a 1936 novel uh, the film was produced by David O. Selznick and directed by Victor Fleming. Set in the American South against the backdrop of the American Civil War and the Reconstructionist era, the film tells the story of Scarlett O'Hara and the, the strong-willed daughter of a Georgia plantation owner following her romantic pursuit of Ashley Wilkes, who is married to his cousin, Melanie Hamilton, and her subsequent marriage to Red Butler. Did I mention it's almost four hours long? Uh, one of the most acclaimed and scrutinized films in history and an Oscar winner, Best Picture, that year. So, uh, this is your first time seeing this? It was my first time seeing it, which is why I picked it. It had been, you know, I needed to watch it, I needed to watch it, and, you know, I'm trying to watch things off my shelf. And, you know, I'd picked it up for like a dollar at the pawn shop. So, I was like, you know, fuck it, we need to watch it. With it <laughs> being four hours long, this was, was a four-hour... Blu-ray hour... or a DVD? It was just a DVD. But okay. it was like the 70th anniversary edition, so I mean, it still looked really good. Like the the restoration of the color and everything was fantastic. Um, this didn't feel like four hours. Like two hours in, when the first disc ended, and they give you this pre, uh, you know interlude, and you know it was presented the same way it would have been back then. You know, it was like. Uh, you know, this is, you know, your interlude or whatever. And then the movie, the second, yeah, it was a good presentation. It just, it kind of was like two movies, but as one movie. And even though, you know, you didn't see like a ton of fighting or like a ton of big action scenes, you know, it was all in the backdrop. Like you said, I thought the movie moved along at a pretty good pace for a four hour movie. Okay. Okay. Now the first time I'd seen parts of this was back in like fourth grade. They showed it to us. But, like, I ended up having to leave in the middle, and then I think it ended, um, or the bell rung or whatever before it even ended. So, just kind of saw parts and pieces of it then. I had always had in my mind this was movie was, like, six hours long. <laughs> um, not quite that long. Uh, a few years ago, I finally was like, all right, I'm going to check it out. All right, almost four hours. Watched it. Really, really enjoyed it. A lot of um, interesting things there. And now let's get to this watch. So, um, yeah, I, I agree. It does go by at a pretty good click. Um, it was actually felt a lot longer as I was flicking through each scene just because there is so much drama between all these characters. Um, let's, I guess, get into the scrutiny part about it. Um, so, obviously, the big part about this movie is it is romantic romanticizing um, what the Annabelle himself. So... I mean, it's obviously a period of time when, um, you know, blacks were enslaved in our country. So why look at, back at that fondness? Um, why look back at that fondly? And I guess my only argument is the fact that it's, it's not modern folks that are looking back at that period fondly. It's the people who had just lost this way of life that are looking at it. And um, I mean, 
I mean, that's history, and um, we move on. I hope we're, we're, we're getting better as a society, but um, I don't think it's, it's, it's so bad to just take a look back at history and see where we came from. I mean, every society grows. <laughs> I mean, and I feel like, you know, that the, the filmmakers and stuff did romanticize it. I, it was one of the things I said in, like, my review is that he spent a lot of money making this movie. Like, you can look at it and tell. Mm-hmm. But like you said, you know, it's not you and I going, oh, man, and, you know, let's, let's think, you know, we, we missed the, the 1850s and the 1860s. It's people who had lost that way of life. But even like in the beginning of the movie, they're at that big party and they're like, oh, you know, they're all like, well, we're going to, you know, we'd beat those yanks. And then, you know, Rhett Butler comes in and, you know, starts naming, well, they have all the industry. They have the railroad. They have this and they have that. And it's like well, we're, we would lose. And they're all like, I can't believe you would say that. And it kind of reminded me, did you ever see Kingdom of Heaven? Um, it's been a while. That's the Crusader movie? Yeah, the Crusader movie. And um, But when there's a scene and they're like talking war and it's like uh, Jeremy Irons character because he kind of has the soldiers who are, I guess, are like the hit squad or whatever, the, the, the Billy badasses. He's like, yeah, if you goes, guys go out in the desert and meet them, you're not going to have water, you're not going to have supplies, whatever, you'll lose. And they were like any any army wearing the cross of god can't lose and it's like it kind of reminded mm-hmm. me of that it's like we're gonna just you know we're gonna kick their ass because we're good old southern boys and we fight and they're like the pretty boy yankees or whatever and i mean i think that if you if you watch that especially the whole movie from like a today's perspective i mean it doesn't shine like a super great light like yeah there's no overt racist language you know there's they're not dropping in bombs or anything like that but i mean yeah they're slaves and they're servants and i don't think it you know partic- paints this movie in a particularly good light plus I mean, i'm sure as we'll get into uh scarlett o'hare and rhett butler are like fucking terrible people like terrible people um and i don't understand why this movie is like romanticized as such this great love story um because it's not, but like I said, we can get into that. <laughs> um, when thinking about uh, the black actors in this, um, they're definitely um, stereotype played up, which um, makes them very charismatic. In some ways, it, it's that unfortunate trope of the dopey black guy, but like in Mammy's like perspective, like I didn't really get that vibe at all. I mean, she was definitely. At parts, even stronger of a character than Scarlet. Not to say that's well. I mean, she has her up and downs, but um, I mean, yeah, Mammy was was her actor. Her actress was really good. I mean, she even won be, uh, best supporting actress and just couldn't mm-hmm. she couldn't even get the award, which is you know goes to show where we were in our country then versus now. That. Yeah, um, but I mean, like it's one of those things as you know, it's, it's hard to look at a movie from that era with, we, we have to, you have to look at it from through our eyes now, obviously, but you also have to look at like when it's being made, the things that they were doing, like, you know, this, that, and the other. So it's just, um, but like I said, I don't, I don't think it, I don't think this movie should be romanticized and like watching it with just watching it. I was like, I, I don't really see the, the, the the romanticism maybe from like the characters but you know like the like from the characters perspective but as you know as an audience who's watching it i don't see it being portrayed that way but that's just me okay let's get into some of the points i got here um definitely wanted to say you know, i mean the score is definitely what really fuels especially the beginning um even as the, the as the title credits roll, they they, uh, they slide across the page and like as if the wind was blowing them in. So love great touches like that. Um, magic hour shots really set a warm um, opening for this thing. Um, so yeah, Scarlett O'Hara, she's quite the uh, complicated brat of a character. I really like her. Um, although she's very complex. <laughs> um, she's lovely at times, but I mean, she's the kind of girl who always wants what she can't get. She can't get. Um, she's relentless. Um, <laughs> she'll like cry to the, until like some guy finally f- helps her, which is pretty pathetic. But at the same time, I find all that charming about her. And um, yeah, I, I'm a fan. Sorry. <laughs> 
So there is a part um, when we get near the end of what was the first disc for me. Um, mm-hmm. So it's after the war. She's come back home to Terra. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she has this resolve if she's never going to, like, go hungry again. And she's, like, looking up at the sky. And I'm like, okay, she's going to be a decent character. She's going to turn into, like, this, like, strong female character. And to a point she does because she becomes super successful mm-hmm. and has the business with the, I think it's the, the logging company or the mill or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or a logging mill company. Anywho. Um, but then, you know, she just turns into... You know, like she does what it takes to to save the the plantation, but you know it's at the expense of her sister, and, and she just she does a lot of stuff that's just very greedy, very selfish, mm-hmm. um, very childish, and you know, like let's be real, she's a bitch. So, um, certainly can be. I, I it was I really liked when uh Mammy was uh, fussing at her at times and really kind of put her in her place and looked how made her really showed off how childish she could be at times um gosh it took me the longest time to actually figure out that Tara was the plantation for some reason that was really slow to click but it all makes sense once you once you figure that out i mean it makes sense because you know they called them that but you know they didn't they never said Tara plantation or like Tara the plantation of the o'hares or something like that Mm -hmm. um but i mean i i don't know i just that i could see where that would be a take a moment to click um, I did want to point out the three key like horizontal um, horizon shots we have here. So we got the first one in the beginning where the father's talking to her about you know he's proud of his Irishness and how much the Irish respect the land and you know the land is their plantation Terra. So a bit of a romanticized ideal of the, the land there. Um, and then yeah, after she comes back home from Atlanta, she has that moment yeah you had mentioned where. Um, you know, she's not going to go hungry again on the horizon. And at the very end, tomorrow's another day where it, she's on the, what the stairway and it like flashes to the horizon shot. So, um, three real key moments there for, uh, Scarlet's character throughout it with all her ups and downs. Um, it kind of surprises me that a lot of people consider Gone with the Wind as the definitive Civil War movie when it really is just a real, real long love story, per, uh, character driven story. Um, with the backdrop of the war instead of having re- any real war focus, um, except for kind of the mi- the middle there with Atlanta and then it's starting. I mean, yeah, it's it's a it's a love story that takes place during the Civil War. And I mean, and yeah, you've got the part in Atlanta where um you know Sherman's march is starting, and mm-hmm. but it, it's more of a plot device to move it along. It's not it's not going and watching. Um, you know, what Gettysburg or like North and South or uh-huh, uh-huh. something like that, which I guess those are more like mini series, but you know, it's not watching a war movie. Um, it's something that just takes place during a war. Like some of the other movies we've done, like army of shadows or, you know, something like that where, uh-huh, uh-huh. you know, but, um, getting back to some fun parts of Scarlett's character. Um, I enjoyed watching. She'll pretty much flirt with any guy and have him in the palm of her hand. And her peers are not too fond of that as they watch their uh, boyfriends uh, flirting with her. Gosh, why is there so much doggone fuss about this Ashley Wilkes guy? Um, you might be baffled by the fact that I like Rhett and Scarlet, but man, Ashley Wilkes is what baffles me. I mean, he, I, uh, when I was looking up some factoids, like the guy who was playing him, you know, he's supposed to be in his twenties. The dude was like forty, and he was like, he, and he personally didn't think he looked good enough to be playing like the stud guy that all the girls were chasing after. That makes a lot of sense. So, and I would say for uh, as much as you love uh, Humphrey Bogart, Clark Gable's my guy. I, every everything I see this guy in, I'm been quite happy with. He's on. I mean, uh, no, he he was great in this movie, and and Vivian uh-huh. Lee was great. Like, I mean, they. Like, I don't like their characters, but that's because they did their characters very well. Okay. Um, so gotcha. I could I could definitely get behind watching more more Mr. Gable movies. I, I think this was the first one. I like the, hist- the history drops throughout it. Like, I can totally imagine, like, if you watch this with a teacher, they would pause it on the, the scene where she's pinching her cheeks to show how that, like, was an early version of, like, using makeup or blush. Um 
you like you had mentioned earlier where Rhett like goes through like this whole laundry list of like why the South cannot win this war and it's basically like hindsight biased because they're pretty much you know writing exactly what the strategy was for the North there so it's it's fun to see pretty much we know exactly what's going to happen play out you know as all these rebel rousers are uh, getting excited about protecting their rights. And, I mean, also, I think still to this day, I mean, you see, you know, they were just so, so ready and excited to go to war. They're like, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll fight them, blah, blah. And you get so many, especially these good old boys are ready to fight or they're like, yeah, we'll go to war. And it's like, dude, like, that's not something we should be wanting. This is something we should be avoiding. And it's just, you know, part of our history as a country but it still comes, and we hear some Dixie play as they uh, go off to war. Uh, it's about the time when the movie goes to Atlanta. Um, Rhett becomes more involved. Uh, oh, love triangles. They make the world go around as it's Scarlet, Rhett, and Ashley, essentially. Um, and then but every, oh, and I guess there's something going on between Rhett and the... I guess she was supposed to be like a hooker or a madam. Oh, okay. Or something. Yeah, yeah she, and she popped come up every in, now and then. Yeah, because she started showing up when he was in the prison in Atlanta because he got busted for being a um a, a blockade runner. Mm-hmm. So, um, I was going to shout out the fact that pretty much Scarlet turns into a professional widow. I think she becomes a widow at least twice. Because let's see, the first guy she marries on a whim dies in the war. And then she marries the guy that owns that store, and they gives her the money to open the mill with Ashley, and then he ends up dying. So, um, yeah, pretty bad luck with the uh, the random husband selection there. Because he gets he gets shots and and dies going to the shanty town to like defend her honor, right? And that that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Got to shout out uh, shout out scenes like the big dance party. Um, for their reputation for being these grand epic moments in this uh, this film, especially that um, scene a little bit later on, whenever you have the big dirt field and it has just you know yards and yards of dead soldiers, and you get the crane shot and then the the Confederate flag there, definitely kind of romanticizing. Um, well, more more or less, just you know, I mean they're they're playing taps there, so it's pretty much just a a defeat um kind of yeah and and that specific scene so i saw something else it was a uh, okay they wanted the the director which also there was three directors um the guy who started and then he quit or whatever and then victor fleming and then he took a break he had a mental breakdown and someone else came in and then he came back and finished it but oh. that particular scene they wanted 2500 extras for that scene with all the soldiers and on the train yard and laying everywhere hurt and dead and all that right. at the end of Sherman burning Atlanta or whatever. And there was only 1500 uh, right that. Yeah. And there was only like 1500, uh, SAG members at the time or SAG mm-hmm. extras. So they ended up using a bunch of dummies. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And, um, if you see many Spike Lee movies, uh, he likes to reference this scene. Um, you know, with some of the uh, racial debates that he uh, he includes in his films as well. So something to look out for. Uh, let's see. Yeah, when it comes to actual war parts of this movie, the burning of Atlanta and like Sherman's March to the Sea, that's all d- depicted really cool, really neat here with um, between the special effects and the production design, especially Atlanta burning. Oh, it's, pretty, it's quite thrilling stuff to see. Uh, I mean, obviously it's... Uh, rear projection but it, it just looks awesome with these burning I mean, they, buildings they, falling they did a lot for you considering the time period like the um mm-hmm. 39 i mean yeah the the costumes and like the stage sets and all of that were just so well put together and so epic um like i know those weren't like things that i think they they, they didn't have those categories in the oscars but i feel like if that was you know they were up for that stuff now they would win because i mean just all like I said, all the all the the costumes and all the stage sets and everything were just immaculate. And they, like I said, that's you could tell they put a lot of time and effort into this movie, which I mean made a lot of sense, can, especially once you can think about how much money it made. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I'll be really surprised if you remember this scene, but I just happened to notice that when I was flipping back through it, there's this funny scene where this cook is like chasing a chicken in the rain. <laughs> and then it like transitioned to the, the, like the, the chicken bones. I'm like, yeah, that's the one little nice thing about flipping scene through scene through a movie. You know, you kind of pick up on those little details that you might have been like, you know, talking to somebody else and missing, you know, some of them. So I actually do remember the chicken scene because I just okay. happened to remember thinking that my grandma told me that the best chicken she ever had in her life is the ones where she, she would go outside as a little girl mm -hmm. and they would catch the chicken and wring the chicken's neck mm -hmm. and then throw it in the boiling water to get all the feathers off. And, you know, then they, you know, cut it up and season it and fry it. And she's like, that's the best fried chicken she ever had in her life. Yeah, okay. So. <laughs> so it's, it's stuck with you. Um, I wanted to point out that, I mean, despite how bratty Scarlet is, um, she does end up doing the, the right thing in a lot of situations. I mean, she joins Melanie there on the front lines as a nurse until she can't stand the, the stench of death anymore. Um, but yeah, she helps her when, uh, you know, she becomes sick and has to help get her out of Atlanta before, um, you know, you things get pregnant? too bad. Oh, was she pregnant? <laughs> yeah, well, she was what... pregnant and had the baby and they just had the baby when they were leaving Atlanta. Right, right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because um, that's right. Because, yeah, the servant girl comes and gets Rhett because Rhett helps with the, yeah, with the getting him out. And uh, it's already and delivered by that them. point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you feel guilty. You want to go join up with the boys. For the final uh, defeat. Anywho. Uh, let's see. Despite the, oh yeah, despite um, the silly world going to pieces, I love you, Scarlet. Some awesome, uh, gosh, I love the, uh, how they're like flooded with like red light all around them as they, they get all romantic. But um, anywho, let's see, uh, back to the devastation of Tara. Her mom's dead at this point. Her dad has a nervous breakdown. Everything's gone to shit, but um, the servants are still there to give her some help as she uh, pretty much puts Tara on her back. And, um, you know, you know, after the intermission, we see her picking some cotton, too, as she deals with those struggles of um, Reconstruction era. Yeah. And then straight up, Mark's a uh, deserted, uh, what they assumed <laughs> was a Union soldier who deserted, um, mm -hmm. shot him right in the chest. On the face, I thought. Uh, face, chest, yeah, I don't know. She blew him away. Point blank okay. range. So it might have been the face. I don't remember. History teacher alert, as they mentioned, carpetbaggers. Wealthy northerners that would come down south with a bunch of money and buy a property. Much to 40, the chagrin 40 acres southerners. and a mule. Uh, let's see. Oh, she finally lays one on Ashley. Yeah, this this middle part was kind of hard to flip through because it's just so much like just talking back and forth. But I mean, when you're watching it in the context of the film, it's it's quite interesting character dynamics going on um, between all of them. Oh, let's see. The guy shows up to buy Tara and they're like, no way. And then, gosh, the dad goes riding off after him for some reason and gets his butt killed. So that happened. Um... Okay, this is the part. Doesn't uh, so Scarlet goes back to Atlanta. She gets married. She gets involved with the the mill and becomes kind of a re relentless businesswoman. And she starts and, and the doing business she, with like Northerners. And go ahead. Yeah, she goes to Atlanta because she's actually going to Rhett to try to get money to save Tara because the carpetbaggers oh, have right. raised the taxes mm -hmm. and they need three hundred dollars. Oh, yeah. And then her and Rhett get into it, and then so she goes and finds. The, the guy who's supposed to be trying to build up his money so he can marry her sister. But he t she tells him that her sister got tired of waiting and is going to marry somebody else. And so she oh, uses yeah. that to leverage to get him to marry her, to get the money to save Tara, and then they open the mill. Um, so, yeah, a lot of manipulation and backstabbing and lying. Like, I get it. She was trying to save her plantation, but I'm pretty sure... If he had went and just married her sister, he would have given the money to save the plantation. But good point. Uh, jumping forward to that um, pretty good scene where Rhett uh, 
shows up with Ashley. Um, Ashley gets in some trouble and is going to get get arrested by the Yankees. But um, pretty much says, hey, we were out having some par fun with some girls, so you should uh, let us on by. And <laughs> that's the thing that <laughs> loses him up a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, and he was actually uh, shot, and then he was shot, and uh, Scarlett's husband was dead because he got shot in the head. I believe was the exact things they said. Um, hmm. Yeah, after she had gotten attacked in Shanty Town. I really like that line between uh, Scarlett and Rhett. Whenever he's like, "Man, you've kissed, kissed all these guys, but no one's really, really planted it on you quite like this." and Gives her that aggressive kiss. I don't know. Rhett's it's a pretty suave guy. I don't know if that was suave so much as, or, or suave in the James Bond sense of 50 no's and one yes is still a yes. Oh, but, but I mean, like she, she, she wanted to be with Rhett like the whole time. So she mm -hmm. just was, I don't know, playing games. Yep. I don't have a, a better way to describe it. She was playing games. So yeah, a lot of games. Uh, fun to see Red and Mammy finally buddy up because she's not too much of a fan of him at first until what they have the baby and then they they share a drink and get buddy buddy. So that's cute. But underneath that awesome portrait of Scarlet there on that, that blue dress. Um, okay, this is yeah, this is after uh, yeah, Red and um, Scarlet finally get married. Um, which starts off well and fun, but um, for some reason they they uh, they don't mix too well, do they? Oh, uh, they do, but there's just that third point of the triangle there that she still wants Ashley. Um, but you know mm -hmm. they have the kid, and he Brett loves the daughter and then spoils her and has you know buys her a pony and you know the stereotypical mm -hmm. daddy, daddy, I want a pony. But, you know, he was teaching her how to ride and how to jump and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't just like a, a, a pony that wasn't doing anything. And then, um, yeah, Rhett's all like they'll go walking through town and Rhett's greeting everybody being a big southern gent. And <laughs> it looks like Scarlet really resents <laughs> the attention or the positivity that people seem to get from him. Well, even he's though it's hers to... now. Yeah, he's trying to build up their reputation because, you know, he she's on her third marriage and he's, you know, his whole family is like black sheep down in Charleston. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, your your home digs and uh, is. Yeah, he's just trying to make their reputation better for Bonnie for when she grows up. And, you know, she, I guess she can get a, a good husband and all that jazz. Um, another dramatic part comes up whenever so. Some people spot uh, Scarlet smooching on Ashley, and um, Rhett forces Scarlet to go to this party, um, where uh, you would think that Melanie would, you know, would finally confront her, but she turns the other cheek, uh, much to the chagrin of everybody else, as uh, Scarlet's wearing that really foxy red dress. So, um, yeah, some some more um, kind of deep seated uh, character dynamics playing out here in the last. Two hours of this movie? Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, things getting even more toxic. Uh, they're really nasty to each other. But, you know, a lot of times, a lot of that uh, nastiness fighting back and forth can get steamy real in a, in a hurry. So that's what happens. Um, Rhett travels abroad with Bonnie, but Bonnie can't handle it. Um, we have the, the famous scene, obviously, where he's just like, oh, why don't you just have an accident already? And she falls down the stairs and loses their uh, their accidental baby there. Um, you haven't seen Barry Lyndon, and you have expressed interest that you don't want to see it anytime soon, so I don't mind spoiling that the whole Bonnie and her horse is... Um, Barry Lyndon uh, borrows a little bit from that to add some drama to the end of that story. I mean, it also goes back to how her father died because he jumped horses and then he tried oh, to yeah. jump the horse at the end and couldn't and fell and died. Mm -hmm. Or not at I the think end. But... They show a flashback of that, don't they? I believe so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, neat to see. Um, okay, so yeah, after Bonnie dies, like instead of like us seeing like Scarlet and Rhett like really go at each other viciously, it's cool to hear it instead like, 
in a conversation between Mammy and um, Melanie right before Melanie passes away. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. They finally had enough of each other. Um, but then, you know, Scarlett uh, figures out she's not interested in Ashley after all. Rhett leaves her, but uh, the, t- uh, the land is what matters, right? Tara. So, um, and yeah, and they, and tomorrow's they, another they, day. The and they, you know, they, oh, the land is what matters. And, you know, especially in the 1800s, being a landowner was a big thing. You had to own mm-hmm. land to really do anything. So, um, also, they had to fight to get that line um, to get I don't give a damn through the censors of the time period. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you just, you, and just pointed out that, you know, it wouldn't fit to say I don't care and it wouldn't fit um that you know that they said that damn wasn't vulgar uh, it didn't have like any vulgarity to it it just meant something um mm-hmm. so okay so um it's really long but God, it's you know it's an epic movie it's a it's a classic um I love the characters I thought I think it's an interesting but troubled romance there um yeah I, I find Gondor win the win Definitely lives up to masterpiece status and it's five stars for me. Oh, I gave it three and a half because that's a dip. Yeah, no, the um, like it just I, I I don't know. I finished nothing about it is bad. There's nothing about the movie that is bad. Even the long run time, everything is done well. It just didn't give me that those vibes when I was done. Also. I really just don't understand why the movie is romanticized the way that it is. Like I said earlier, like both Rhett and Scarlet are fucking terrible characters. Like I think Scarlet, this is how bad of a character I think she is. She's a better character than Jenny or she's a worse character than Jenny from Forrest Gump. And Jenny's like one of the worst fucking characters ever. <laughs> Scarlet's worse than she is. So, okay. Drawing yeah. a line in the sand. All right. My pick for this episode, Fearless. And I picked it because it was on your, the same list, the movies that you own and wanted to watch, right? Yep. Movies I own and hadn't seen. Yep. All right. So also known as Hao Yanjia in Chinese and Jet Li's Fearless in the UK and in the US. Um, the movie is from 2006. It's a martial arts film directed by Ronnie Yu, starring Jet Li. It is loosely based on the life of Hyao Yunjia, a uh, Chinese martial artist who challenged foreign fighters in a highly publicized um, match. Um, and this was happening during the time of... Um, Imperialism was coming, or uh, nationalism in China was dwindling, and the Western influence was coming in, and a lot of world changes. It doesn't really depict much of that. I mean, there's like a scene, but um, pretty solid kung fu movie. Let's get into it. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to help me out with the story at some points because you catch it, you capture those, those story nuances so nicely, Joey. I appreciate that. I do what I, on it. I do what I can. Um, it is on my case of you know I have a slip cover on it, and it says it was uh, Jet Li's last martial arts epic. Now I don't know if that ended up being true. Um, hmm. Also, the choreographer was um, Young Wo. It's the guy who usually directs all the Donnie Yen movies. He's like one of the best choreographers, so that's why the choreography. A uh, Young Wo Ping, I think, is his name. Um, I can tell you in like two seconds. But anyway, that's why the choreography for the fight scenes is so freaking good Okay. Um, in this this movie. Now, I didn't remember seeing this, but it turns out that I had. I But I only remember like two parts. Um, and I saw this a few years ago with my dad, and I'm pretty sure there's an, a dubbed English version floating around somewhere because I don't think I would have watched this in subtitles with pop. Um, but I'll get to the part where I finally recognized that I... Uh, had seen it. You, do you like the name of this movie, Fearless? It's it's somewhat on the generic side. A lot of these like martial arts movies is just like Kingdom or Hero or Fearless. It's just so there's such bland titles. I mean, I guess you know it's Fearless when you think about you know he's gonna fight those four guys like back to back to back to back. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, what are, what else are they gonna call it? I mean, like in China, it's it's his name. Um, 
but I mean, like you have Ip Man. They're just called Ip Man. I mean, and that's his character's name. So, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, because Jet Li's other one, the hero, it's just it's just hero. Yeah. But I mean, then you do get stuff, you know, like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, or um, a touch of Zen. So I mean, true. I mean, it's I think it's more modern um, martial arts movies that have picked up on that. I don't know. I'd have to look and do it. See if I can give you a whole list. Uh, so starts off with kind of a disjointed beginning with it. Then proposing that this uh, style of martial arts should be um, be an Olympic event. I see how it fits into the overall context of the story. But, I mean, they don't really go back to it. It's just kind of a uh, scene setter as we uh, then jump into this being a period piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely set in like that 19... 19- it's like what 1905 to 1910 like the end of it is 1910 and the rest of it is even earlier than that because he's a little kid so Mm -hmm. so until like the late 1800s did you think that um despite this being a period piece it kind of had a modern feel to the characters it didn't really feel set back then but you you would think that that would be a big criticism but i kind of found it actually i like i got more in sync with the movie quicker cuz the cuz they felt more relatable and modern i guess maybe it was because you know i and knew they were kids. supposed to be yeah i i guess because there was supposed to be a western influence on them especially by the end that you know they would start acting and dressing more western like you'd see people in suits and ties and mm-hmm. um they had more eurocentric haircuts instead of the half shaved with the long braid and all of that. So, I mean, I, I just took it as the, what was supposed to be, you know, the U S and Britain and these other places with their influence on, on their culture at that time. Okay. Uh, some neat characters off the top. We got his, uh, his dad, who's a master, um, get a, uh, Basically, he doesn't have a lot of patience for his son, especially when he's doing his business. And um, we do see that theme of mercy early on during the dad's fight. And then his best bud is more of the scholarly type, gives him scholarly advice throughout. Um, Gets motivated when um, one of the kids in town beats his ass on that um, stone circle. Uh, Oh, it's the son of the guy who his father lost to. Yeah, that sounds right. And that he comes around later during the um, the midpoint, right? Yeah, and you know gets this fucking shit pushed, mm-hmm. and should have died because he fell off of a fucking platform and face planted <laughs> into cement bricks. And then well, this guy's dead, and he just gets up and walks away. And I'm like, the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, after getting his ass beat, it inspires him to relentlessly train, and he's smacking that rock montage, getting all tough. And then we flash forward, and we Full got Jet Li. Of Pi May. <laughs> All right, right. Um, but then he turns into kind of a big goofball, and like he's like mastered his art. He's a badass fighter, but he's kind of like just takes life so easy since he like he seems to have everything figured out. He thinks um, keeps going back. Oh, the um, I like the motif of the uh, like the town bum or whatever mm-hmm. who always runs into him. He's like. Oh, the champion or whatever um the set piece where i finally was like oh yeah i have seen this movie is where he's like jumping up the stairs that are like two by fours that are like um stuck in the in the ground leading up to this platform and that was a lot of work they put into that that really dramatic looking fight with this uh this tower that i am uh, and that I and assume they he, built it for the fight. I don't know. <laughs> that's where he fought the guy who beat him up as a kid. And that's okay. where the guy fell off of that. And I was like, oh, that guy should be dead. Um, right. Okay. So, yeah, really good fights. Um, what did you think of the, the wire foo? Uh, I'm coming around more to wire foo. I used to not be a humongous fan of it, but I'm coming around to it. It's fine. Yeah, the the action in this is very swift and at times a little too floaty. Um, I noticed it, but it doesn't really bother me. So, but but I do remember whenever that that bugs you and touches in. So I was curious. Um, some sweet drumming for that fight. Um, it was it a line of chicks all banging on drums and some good stuff there? 
Yeah, it definitely um, had some some uh, good music and stuff for that for that for that scene. And his carefree lifestyle, he's accumulating a lot of debt. He amasses all these followers and buys the whole house drinks, but doesn't put a whole lot of effort into where the money for all that's coming from. So uh, kind of starts to bury himself in that way. And a montage of cool fights um, as he yeah, gains that following. That was the mon- was him winning the tournament of, to be the champion of Taijin, right? Or whatever. That sounds right. I know there was a but there were fights like there was one in the rain. It was just kind of a montage, I guess, of him getting to that point. Yeah. And then things get a little bit more dramatic. He gets tricked into basically challenging this um, one fighter because he believes that his gang roughed um, somebody from his um, his gang up. And so, um, oh yeah, they aren't they like. Con, um, fight contracts is a big deal in this movie where like you have to sign it and like it basically assures like you're up to whatever happens in the fight yeah it's a death contract so it's like you sign it i guess and if you die you die you understand that's what's going to happen because they talk about that at the end when he's fighting the you know the big muscled up american the strongest man in the world can tip over a train with one hand or whatever the shit um o'brien and he's like make sure to tell him you know we we have death contracts but we're all here for entertainment or whatever and the guy's like he wants to kick your ass and that <laughs> kind of not that it was at the same level but it kind of reminded me of like Thunderlips and and um rocky yeah. and rocky three mm-hmm. but that's later we'll get there oh cool all right so um Crazy swords in that fight uh, between him and yeah the guy that he challenges there calls him out um, ends in really brutal fashion. He does this uh, death punch thing, crushes uh, like I guess it hits his heart and like crushes the bone behind and spurting out blood out of his, out of his mouth. Gets pretty pretty gruesome there. Um, but in and as retribution, uh, the gang goes and kills his whole family. And he essentially becomes a wanderer. Um, uh, it kind that kind of remember. So this aspect of the movie reminds me of a lot of other movies in kind of Asian martial arts realm, where you have this main character who has to kind of go on a joy a uh, voyage of or like a journey of self discovery, a walkabout, I guess. Um, even despite despite the fact that he's more middle aged, but um, what say you? Yeah, no, that's I mean that's all right. Um, <laughs> you you nailed it right on the head, and then you know, you know like lots of nature porn there for a while. With, you know, mm-hmm. mountains and waterfalls yeah. and rice fields and yep. just so. So he ends up passing out, gets taken in by this village where they plant they plant rice. So he kind of um, get gets some humility here, um, a worth ethic kind of. Even though he's always kind of had kind of a childish spirit to him, um, you know, he sees the he really likes the kids going and trapping dragonflies. Um, he at first doesn't know what to really make of this moment where like everybody in the, the village like pauses and like takes in the, the breeze. But that ends up becoming an important thing and um, him learning to plant rice and get better at it. But then eventually, as you would imagine, the gang, a gang comes and threatens the village. So... What's he do about that? Uh, you know, beats their ass. <laughs> you know, uh, he's a more few rusty. Kicks. Yeah, yeah, he beats their ass, and um, you know, it's uh, he does he does what Jet Li does. He does what uh, who wow, you wow, I'm Jet. He does what Jet Li does. So you said you nodded off at one point in this. Was was it was it during this part where he was finding himself? This was part of it um, because I I missed the fight where he hit the like the twirl punch that blew out the dude's back. But I saw the clip of it when mm-hmm. they did the th- the flashback at the end. Right. And I saw the parts in and out where he was in the mountains. Um, like I saw the part where. Um, you know, the lady was blind, but she was replanting where he'd planted the rice and had like fucked up. And then, yeah, I missed him fighting those thugs, but I remember him coming back and it being Western culture, mm-hmm. and it, it takes us back into the to the last person he's fighting in the four, um, because he's fighting 
the four guys in a row and we'd seen him fight two or three at the beginning. And then he ends up, they show him fighting the wrestler and it shows him fighting the Japanese guy. Mm -hmm. Um, so yep. Comes back, uh, to his digs, makes, um, makes, not sure if he really makes up with his, uh, his scholarly buddy, but I think, uh, he helps him get promoted, um, into some of these fights, um, after being gone so long, takes on the wrestler. That's a great fight back and forth. Um, and finally has a chance to show the guy some mercy. Um, I did like the back and forth aspect of, you know, he's throwing some good kicks at him, but the wrestler, you know, has this killer grip on him, but eventually, um, gently stops him from basically getting smacked in the head with some nails. Um, so shows him some mercy there and they both, uh, hold their hands up in victory as we move into, uh, the climax, a little, Martial arts on a mountaintop porn is what I, I named that. Would you, would you concur? I'm sorry, you said what? Martial arts on a mountaintop porn. Yeah, 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 for sure. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was doing my best imitation of it to, to wake Joey up. Oh, yeah, no, it's my bedtime. Like, you, you, you starting this way too late for me, but it's fine. All right, so the climax enters this challenge where he must take on a boxer. Uh, kind of has a, I think that's a pike, the the long stick with the the pointy end, a, um, a fencing the pike champion, or a spear, mm-hmm. um, a fencing champion, and then the Japanese um, martial artist as well. So, um, not sure how much you picked up on this. How much you're a fan of that? That Hamlet, this had a very, very Hamlet feel to the end of this movie. You dig? Um, I'm not super familiar with Hamlet, so I'll take your word on it. Okay. Um, especially the Kenneth Branagh one, like the whole like feel of the duel being in like this banquet hall felt a lot like this. And in Hamlet, you know, he, they poison the blade and stab him and then he dies. Um, at the end of the fight where this they poison his tea because the Japanese promoter is basically gu- guaranteeing the West a win um, against this guy. So that's the whole Hamlet dynamic. Definitely um, adds a lot of drama, kind of... I, I guess this is based off a true story, too, so I don't know. You know, whenever you see reminiscent or elements in movies. Or I think it's loosely movies. based, so they probably... Okay. Maybe they added some stuff to... You know, because it's an adaptation and loosely based, so they probably... Sure movied it up a little bit i'm sure did you have a favorite uh i guess the japanese versus chinese would be your your favorite bout at the end there i mean that was good i did like when it was the fencing versus the japanese sword Mm -hmm. and you know the fencer had like the kind of like the you know what batman would wear but without the spikes you know to protect against the swords and he Mm -hmm. stuck his sword on and cut it off and then he put his sword through the rapier handle yeah and took it from him that was really cool yeah Oh, um, yeah, the, the match goes on despite him like spurting up, um, I guess he's coughing up blood at that point, um, yeah, coughing blood. up something, yuck. Um, maybe bile. It was like black but, too, it was, it was gross. Yes, I think um, that's probably bile, maybe it was part of like the poison mixed with the blood or something. Oh, uh, okay. Um, the mercy motif comes back as... He finally, you know, he's able to do that that death punch on the guy, but stops just before he hits him. And uh, like you said, flashes back to the previous one. He collapses. Everybody uh, cheers his honor as he's well, praised as a hero. Well, because the Japan, they went to announce uh, the Japanese guy as the winner, and he was mm-hmm. like, "No, I didn't win," and helps him up and says he wins, and the Japanese promoter's pissed at him and. Right. Um, he's like, why did, why did you, you won? He's like, no, he won the last round. He won. Get it through your head. Like I thought the dude was about to kill the Japanese promoter. <laughs> yeah, it definitely seemed that way. Yeah. It was cool to see the fighter have all that integrity, but, but just, he had a scum, uh, manager who, um, it's up to no good. Great fighting, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Great fighting throughout a uh, very typical kind of arc with the guy who has everything has to discover himself, comes back, but I like the whole like exhibition style of a lot of these fights. Um, so yeah, that was kind of a pretty cool aspect. Um, all the weapons um, and Jet Li, he's, he's awesome. So I give this a four. Good. I give good it a three movie. and a half. Um, but I mean, like, I feel like if I rewatched it, it could probably go to a four. Um, 
just because, I mean, it is a very beautiful movie. They spent a lot of time with the shots. They spent a lot of time on the choreography, um, whether they were showing it, you know, going really fast or they would slow it down. Um, so, yeah, no, they, I mean, it's, it, it's definitely a very good martial arts movie. It's definitely worth watching. Nice. All right. So now we're going to talk about what movies you're going to watch next. Uh, what, what you got picked out? All right. So I've decided that I'm going to alternate. So like for this movie, for this one, I picked Gone with the Wind. So that was something that I haven't seen that I wanted to see, whether it's off my shelf or just in my watch list. On the opposite week, I'm going to pick something that is I've seen, but I haven't seen in a long time, or I feel like I need to rewatch for X, Y, Z reasons. So I'm going to do this week is going to be a repick or a rewatch, okay. and it's going to be Batman Returns. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Tim Burton. I um when I was watching Hudsucker Proxy, like the the way the city um looks, kind of with this gothic feel, reminded me a lot of that movie it's a i rewatched that a few novembers ago for a, like a batman watch-a-thon and that one is good so that'll be fun to talk about and i haven't as much as i've seen batman 89 and you know me and you watched that earlier this year yeah. i i don't know if i have seen batman return since i was a child like okay. i remember you know i remember that the penguins in it i remember the cat woman's in it and i remember that it's like dark and gothic I don't really remember much else. Maybe I will once I start watching it, but I just don't. Okay. And my pick, I'm going with, I think this is, yeah, this is Japanese. It's a Japanese horror film. It's been described as the Japanese seven. It's a, just in this last announcement, it is getting added to the criterion collection as spine one, one, five, five. The movie is called cure. Um, it's been on my radar. And I was like, hey, let's do uh, do this one with uh, Joey. So, All right. I mean, that's a, it's on the channel. a Japanese. Well, yeah. I don't have the channel currently, so. Uh, we can borrow it. Yeah, I can. Don't listen to this criterion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, John, Johnny's got everything, mostly. Mm-hmm, he's, mm-hmm. He's, a good, he's a good friend like that. He has the expendable income to buy the entire collection. Yeah, yeah. Same with your lo- your 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 local public library. Yes. Uh, Cure Although it's from not 19... it's not out yet. <laughs> Nineteen ninety seven, right? Yes. Well, there were several of them that popped up. So. Uh, yeah, Kiyoshi. I, I, oh, his last name having... is Kurosawa. Okay. I kept having the hardest time finding Fearless because it kept bringing up all kinds of weird years for that uh, that title. Cool, cool. All right, I'm I'm in. Let's do it. All right. And uh, we'll do this a little earlier, so Joey has a little more pep in his step by the end. I've been talking <laughs> too long, but I can wore him down. Um, it's but just you, I'm mm-hmm. usually like in getting ready to go to bed because I get up so early. So cool, cool. No worries at all. Well, tell us what. Uh, tell us your spiel about how they get in touch with us. Um, at the average movie. <laughs> the average Joe's movie club cast at gmail dot com. Of course, you can follow either one of us on Letterbox. Those will be in the show notes. Leave us comments there. Our Facebook page, our Twitter accounts for the show, or our personals. There's all sorts of ways um, to get in touch with us, and we'd love to hear from you. Maybe some ideas, or maybe maybe some input. Um, you know, for things you we said that you don't agree with, or you very much agree with. We just want to hear from you, and uh, that's a good way to do it. Mission accomplished. All right, so Joey, what do we do this show? I think it's something like because we love watching movies and talking talking about about them. them. Night. Later. Jinx. You and I have 
Patrick and Feely. They are just starting. I think this just might be my mason. 